Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll be highlighting um, a few things about the Asia Foundation's economic governance indexes. We define economic governance within the foundation as um, in two ways. One is the economic transactions that take place between the state and the private sector. So things like entry costs, uh, regulatory costs, um, land access and, and, and land, land regulation, for instance. But we also assess the institutional environment. So the overall environment that provides support for private sector development. So just to give you an example, um, each of the, the EGIs varies from country to country, but this would be a typical set of sub-indices for, for, for an economic governance index. And as you can see, we're measuring things, again, that are transactional, like entry costs, access to, to land, et cetera, but we're also measuring the larger uh, and broader business environment, so informal charges, um, which is a nice way of saying corruption, of course, um, participation, um, dispute resolution, and the, the judicial environment. So the broader environment that supports private sector development. And so in this, in this way, um, our EGIs are a little bit different than doing business, um, because doing business focuses a little bit more on those transactional issues, and we focus on, a, on the, the broader environment as well. Just to step back a bit and give you uh, a short history of, of our work doing EGIs, um, the, the EGI started in 2005 in Vietnam and has had year-to-year -year iterations in that country since. Um, it was quite successful in Vietnam, and that allowed us to um, adapt the tool um, across South and Southeast Asia in many different contexts. So our last EGI was launched last October in, uh, in Dhaka for Bangladesh, and we are currently working on a EGI for Malaysia that will be launched hopefully by the end of this year. And um, sort of what this highlights is that it's a tool that can be adapted across many different environments from uh, you know, very low income um, countries to high middle income countries like Malaysia. So we've been able to adapt our sub-indices and adapt our approach in each country and make the tool very country specific. So um, what's the purpose of, of the EGI research? As, as Bruce mentioned, it's really to set up the agenda for reform. And so the idea is to, is to have objective research about the business environment to bring together uh, three very important stakeholders, the local government, the national governments, and the business community to talk about reform issues. Um, so um, we see it as a rallying point around which uh, these, these different stakeholders can, can come together and begin discussing reform issues. In addition, uh, national governments have been able to take up the EGI as a benchmarking tool for provincial and district government progress on economic reform issues. So for instance, Vietnam uses the EGI as a provincial bench, as one of its provincial benchmarking tools for progress on economic reform issues. Um, in addition, the, the, the EGI uh, creates uh, large data sets um, across all of our different countries, which have been instrumental for, for academic research and development. Um, we get a, a lot of researchers interested in our data, using our data for, for, for research on uh, the business environment. And um, our partners, donors, and NGOs have also been able to use the data uh, for benchmarking and for research purposes. So for instance, in Cambodia and Bangladesh, we've been able to partner with IFC, and they've been able to use the data for different purposes. In Vietnam, uh, GTZ, which is now GIZ, um, has also been able to use the data for, for provincial benchmarking um, as well. So it's been a public good for the larger development community to use the data. So I'll just be very brief on the methodology, and you can ask me more questions about this if you're interested. Um, but I'll, I'll briefly say uh, sort of our three main pillars of, of the methodology. So first, um, the collection process begins with the selection of indicators from both hard and soft data um, that, that, that's relevant to the private sector. So the soft data that we collect is from firm level surveys about the business environment. So we'll ask firm owners directly, for instance, about the number of days it takes for them to get a business license. Or we'll ask them, is it typical for firms in your line of business um, to pay gifts to get things done from the government? So we'll ask questions like this. And again, this is a little bit different from doing business, which, um, which uses an expert survey. So they, they, uh, they survey uh, lawyers and accountants about the business environment, and we survey firms themselves. Um, so at the basic level, we want the survey to be the aggregate voice of the business uh, of businesses within the country. So 
uh, we, we collect our sample very rigorously, avoiding selection bias. We also make sure that our uh, data is gender disaggregated so that we have a clear picture of the constraints faced by women entrepreneurs and, and we can look systematically at the differences between male and female entrepreneurs. Secondly, the sub-indices are constructed as a basket of, 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 the indicators are constructed as baskets of sub-indices, rather, reflecting the most important issues in the business environment. And each of the, the sub-indices, all of the indicators in each of the sub-indices is normalized against the best practices in the country. So for instance, if it takes, if in the best province in the country it takes five days to get a business license, all other provinces are ranked against the standard of five five days, rather than an outside standard such as one day or you know two hours or whatever, um, so that um, it's, it's uh, demonstrable that any and, and attainable for any province in, in that particular country to attain the, the best score in the country. Um, and lastly, for most of the EGIs, we, we end up weighting the, the sub-indices um, according to the most important issues in the country. So for instance, if transparency is the most important constraint for the business environment, that sub-index will be weighted more in the overall composite index. Um, I can talk again a little bit more about how we do the weighting, but generally through uh, regression analysis that we determine what the weights are for each of the sub-indices. Some officials and politicians have actually used the EGI um, as a tool to, to introduce new initiatives. So for instance, in Bangladesh last year, uh, the Commerce Minister um, at the launch of the EGI outlined a series of reforms based on the findings from the EGI around transparency and access to information. Um, he also was very displeased to find that there were uh, the, the, that women's entrepreneurship was very low in Bangladesh, and he outlined an initiative to encourage women's entrepreneurship in Bangladesh. So, um, it's it's been a tool that has been helpful for officials as well in terms of getting out the message of the initiatives that they want to take. And I'll just say a few words about the EGI and, and private sector development before I before I end. So one of the things that we're really interested is. Does governance actually matter in terms of business growth and development? So um, we've done some extended analysis using the results of the EGI as a measure of good governance um, against, um, against uh, a, a few different measures. And one of these measures is the likelihood that an entrepreneur will expand her business. So we asked the entrepreneurs, will, would you be likely to expand your business over the next two years? And we we, we got the answers to that in the survey. And um, we did some regression analysis controlling for, for firm and provincial level factors. And what we found in Cambodia, for instance, is that a 10 point increase in the EGI score results in a nearly 10 point increase in the likelihood that an that entrepreneur would expand her business over the next two years. And the same analysis for Bangladesh shows a 6% increase. And so while Correlation does not imply causality, and that's not what we're saying here. Um, there, this is um, evidence that there is a link between good governance and, and um, the effect it has on entrepreneurs in the business environment and how they view the business environment. So um, it's very important for us to establish that link. Um, so with that, I'll end, and I will introduce my colleague, Veronique sazli lezak So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Asia Foundation's approach to public-private dialogues. And the objective is actually to improve economic governance at the subnational level. When we work uh, with public-private dialogues, it's actually as an approach or a way to look at the business environments, not only from the point of view of the large enterprises, but also from the point of view of the micro, small, and medium enterprises, which are actually the bulk of the economy in a lot of the countries where we work. And it's working with them on identifying the main constraints that they're facing in their day-to-day -day operational work. So that can be licensing, it can be their interaction with the public sector, it can be informal fees, it can be monopolies, a whole range actually of constraints that they are facing. The approach is a multi-stakeholder approach and it has a lot of configuration depending on the country where we work, but also within a country from one province to another. And that varies depending on the issues uh, but also the sectors uh, that are involved in the dialogues. The objective is to bring to the table the main actors of the economy, so the lo local governments, but also the representative of the national governments, and on the private sector side, the business community, again, including the micro and small enterprises or even the informal sector, 
and the civil society, all of the actors that could have a, a stake actually in improving the business environment and uh, promoting private sector development. The objective is to build some coalition for reforms and to find within the private sector the one who are going to be supportive, supportive of uh, the reform to increase transparency and uh, one of the main outcome of this dialogue is just dissemination of information and that's uh, as Nina mentioned earlier a big step and of course the objective is also to have to increase accountability from the public sector towards the private sector. The process itself is very it's very important that it's uh, result driven so of course one of the main advantage of this dialogue is to build trust respect and more understanding between the public and the private sector but you wouldn't have a an ongoing dialogue without having some very concrete, tangible results. So all of these dialogues or this process are really based on asking the private sector to raise their issues, identify some priorities, and then work with the public sector to really find some solutions that are achievable and that can be implemented. So there is a lot of work before the dialogues themselves and uh, documenting, identifying the issues, documenting the issues, and making sure that the private sector is ready to argue with the public sector about what can be done. What is really important in the process to make sure that it, the process itself is effective is to have reliable information, document the issue, try to come with data that actually makes uh, uh, the whole process more uh, meaningful. Make sure that the process is inclusive. We mentioned uh, gender in the, the EGI. It's important that not only women are in the room or at the table in the negotiation, but that their issues are heard and that the issues that women raise are also taken into account by the public sector. But that also works for micro-enterprises, for informal sector or minorities like in Sri Lanka. It's important also that the process is owned by the stakeholders themselves. The Asia Foundation is uh, the facilitator of the dialogue, but it's not us identifying the issues or even finding solution. And again, we need to have results tangible and as much as possible try to measure the impact of these uh, reforms. We've based our experience on many different programs, and some financed by USAID, some by USAID or from other donors in Indonesia, the Philippines, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and um, new countries are interested in the process, like Nepal, Timor Leste, India, maybe Afghanistan soon when uh, Bruce is there. So as we were working and implementing and working as practitioners, we were developing tools to make the whole process also more effective and measure the impact. So that means uh, having tools to uh, analyze the need for reform, uh, to document the constraint, measure, measure progress, but also to build the capacity of both the public and the private sector to engage meaningfully in the public-private dialogues. So those set of tools can be organized in three big groups. The first one is assessing the business environment as a whole. So you saw the example of the economic governance index, but we can have some more flexible and less uh, expensive in time of uh, money and time uh, tools like a business barometer or a diagnostic policy research. And uh, we have also sets of tools to document a specific policy or specific uh, uh, constraint that was raised in the dialogue. We use a regulatory impact assessment as a way to measure cost and benefits of uh, a change or reform. And we have different types of uh, trainings and networking activities to reinforce the, uh, the capacity of the participants to the dialogue. One element that we're working on currently is to develop an online database to uh, capture all the information from the, uh, by issue from the time it is raised to all the actions taken uh, to try to find some solutions. Uh, indicators also to measure the, uh, the um, the impact of the change in the policy, but also over time being able to have some um, quantitative uh, information about uh, at which level was it uh, solved, was it at the local level or the national level, who were the, the main actors in solving the, uh, the problem. So all of these tools are helping the public-private dialogue and trying to make them more powerful. So finally, a few examples on how these dialogues have concretely helped the public sector, the private sector, uh, hopefully the public too, actually, in uh, different countries. So I have the example of Cambodia, where I started working in 2003 uh, with uh, public-private dialogues at the provincial level, and that was actually a program financed by USAID for a year. But in one year, we achieved to, uh, some really meaningful uh, 
uh, progress in three provinces where we worked, actually, the environment tax that was a tax that nobody really knew what it was about and what it was for, was um, removed by the uh, local government, first reduced to 50% and then removed. So that was a big achievement. Uh, in other places, uh, and actually now in seven provinces, there were some information boards uh, that uh, Nina mentioned that were posted outside of the main uh, departments. And uh, more recently, we've worked with the community-based organization in the fishery, and uh, they've reached agreements with the public uh, government, with the public sector, local and government, uh, on uh, agreement on fishing areas. And that was actually uh, a problem that had been uh, dragging on for years, and it was a, a problem of dispute between commercial fisheries and uh, community fisheries. In Sri Lanka, there have been some concrete partnerships in, uh, for example, in solid waste disposal between the public and the private sector. But the, we have there uh, worked a lot on streamlining regulations, taxes, licenses, publishing some uh, business-friendly documents so that they will know exactly what was the process to obtain uh, a license or uh, how to pay the taxes and how it was calculated. In Bangladesh, uh, there is the example of the trade license uh, that was raised in the district of Sidet, uh, where actually the private sector were complaining about the fact that they needed trade licenses for almost uh, each one of the products that they, they trade, and that could take weeks actually to obtain. And the mayor, at the dialogue itself, uh, committed to streamline the process and made it reduce the, the time to one day. And I've been there since, and it's actually one day. We've interviewed a few business people. And that has actually resulted in an increase of the issuance of licenses of 70 to 80 percent. So that's also beneficial for the public sector. That's so the revenue from the city corporation, from the, the municipality, increase. Uh, another really interesting outcome of this dialogue in Sri Lanka, has, uh, in Bangladesh, has been the creation of business, uh, women business fora. They participate, women participated in the public private dialogue, but they uh, realized that they wanted to maybe prepare the dialogue by discussing among themselves first, and uh, they felt comfortable actually discussing their issues among businesswomen before coming to the dialogue, and they decided to create some uh, business association of women. And one of the outcome of this business association is that they started negotiating with the commercial banks about easier access or facilitated access to uh, credit. So they still need to show that their business plan is uh, credit worthy, but at least the documents that are required by the commercial bank are uh, easier for women uh, to obtain than, than before. So those are some concrete examples of public-private dialogues, and there will be more in the, in the book. Now, just to wrap it up. So what we've been working toward is a conservative, adoptive methodology. We're constructing it as we go along and learning in the process. And we work particularly with local governments because in many cases, we can leverage whatever is achieved at the local level into national level impact. At that point, there's nothing to beat a governor accompanied by his council and local reform champions being able to speak on their own issues at the national level without any apparent assistance from any other external agency. So the elements of this approach if we may just uh, outline it. Uh, focus and sustain attention over time. Uh, backed up by thorough analysis and attention to timing. Uh, quite often the reform happens when elec an election happens uh, or somebody dies. Uh, you gotta be on, on time and you gotta be there at the right time at the right place. There's a big speech, there's a big visit to some uh, event and the president needs to announce something. So you, you, you better be ready with something to announce that will make him look good and as a result be able for you to be able to achieve the reform. Uh, attention to communication, something that I guess we ought to learn from Washington DC. Uh, <laughs> the right spin on the reforms and the mobilization of champions and coalitions and finally implementation assistance to ensure that the reform is sustained. Uh, and that's crucial. Uh, sure, you have flexibility of timing, you're there at the right time and right place. How do you make sure that once adopted, it continues? The issue is, how do you bring everybody to a pro-reform 
heavy influence stance. And at this point, this is where the projects come in. This is what we bring to the donors, of course. The activities and the outputs, the analytics, the dialogues, the customized presentations, the statements, letters, policy instruments. Quite often, this is what you see in a log frame that's called the outputs. And, uh, but underlying all that is an understanding of the politi political economy of the, co of, the, of the situation. And once you're effective with all of these activities, you're able to achieve reform. So it all goes together. So in dynamics, we're looking for development entrepreneurs. Uh, these are the heroes of the, of the context. In local partner organizations, not in Asia Foundation, in local partner organizations, they take point in working toward the desired reforms. They are the leaders in providing technically correct, politically feasible, context-specific assistance to reform partners. Uh, quite often, it's nice to be able to be in a position to write the speech of whoever needs to make the speech. Uh, sometimes we refuse to do that as technical assistance, but actually, writing speech is a very important thing. And if you can get into a position to write the minutes of meetings, even better. <laughs> uh, elites and leaders who invest their political capital in reforms. Now, uh, in most of these situations, there is somebody who wants to enter the business. And it is in their interest to support that reform. And it's best to explicitly identify who wants in and facilitate their entry. Reform partners able to quickly adapt to emerging opportunities. And finally, donors who are willing to cooperate, who are willing to be flexible. Now, the Age Foundation likes uh, uh, cooperative agreements and grants. Uh, we have a great difficulty with uh, contracts. <laughs> but uh, we often uh, attempt to try to come to a discussion whereby there's an understanding of what needs to be done. And so the situation is you've got the end points of the reform, beginning and end, and you try to agree on what you achieve in between and be flexible about what's achieved in between, but have the beginning and the end fixed. So a project structure that we're looking for in a lot of these situations is that we have donors who provide grants to the foundation. The foundation, uh, helps with project design and management. That management surrounds a development entrepreneur. The development entrepreneur is the keystone of a reform coalition. And that reform coalition are partners in government, civil society, private sector who make the reform happen. Donors, Asia Foundation, and local organization working together in a flexible arrangement to get things done. Thank you.